introduce you guys. I'm going to invite, um, right now, I'm going to invite Eli to come up. He's going to help me teach you. So real quick, I'm gonna, what Eli and I are going to do as far as preaching tonight is we're going to kind of tag team, pass it back and forth to each other. Okay, so first and foremost, I kind of want to talk about conversation. Last week, we talked about what? We talked about how to go through the gospel in the most simple way possible so that we can um, repeat that to somebody that doesn't know Jesus Christ. Okay, so along the Romans road, what was the first scripture? That's the book. The first scripture was Romans 3.23. We've all sinned. Here's the deal. If you guys weren't here last week especially, or if you were and you forgot all of this, I urge you, get a pen out, write it on your forehead. Doesn't matter how you write it down, just write it down in a way that you can actually remember this. Because I'm literally giving you the simple gospel to be able to share with your friends. First and foremost, Romans 3.23, we've all sinned. Second, Romans 6.23. Sin brings death, but God gives life. Romans 5 8, God sent us Jesus. Thank you for that, Lord. And Romans 10 9, if you declare Jesus as your Lord, you shall be saved. So here's the deal. As I'm talking this out, I see some people giggling. I see some people laughing. I see some people that are just kind of tuning it out, not listening to it. Why would that be? Because apparently Jesus Christ is boring, right? I just, I just declared the gospel to you guys. For us as Christians, this should be the most exciting thing on the face of the planet. Because here's what the simple gospel is. We've all sinned, which is not good. Sin equals death, which means all of you are dead if you're a sinner. God gives us life, which means that if you receive Jesus Christ in your heart, you're not dead anymore. Here's the the big one. Here's the big one. If you declare Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. So, how do you get saved? Declare Jesus Jesus is Lord. Okay. So, how many of you guys go into your schools and you actually declare Jesus Christ as your Lord? Because if you don't, begin to question salvation. That's what the last scripture says right there. On Romans Road. If you declare Jesus as Lord, you shall be saved. Declaring Jesus as your Lord doesn't always mean that you get in everybody's say, face and say, Jesus is Lord! In fact, I recommend you don't do that. I recommend you be a little nicer <laughs> in the way that you, you, you declare Jesus as Lord. And quite frankly, sometimes it doesn't even take words. Sometimes, simply all it takes is living different than everybody else. Because if you live for the gospel and you live for the Bible and you're not going to parties and you're not drinking and you're not sleeping around and you're not doing all of these things that you see your friend doing, you're living the gospel. You're living this out. You're declaring Jesus as your Lord. And then when people come to you and say, how come you don't do How come you don't drink? How come you don't party? How come you don't do drugs? How come you don't do that stuff? Uh, because Jesus is is my Lord. Oh, that's lame, dude. Maybe to you it is. But for me, I'm free from having to live with the repercussion of my sin. Some of the simple repercussions of sin is a hangover if I choose to get drunk. <laughs> Some of those that's worse could potentially be death because there's so many people who go to parties that drink, especially from the age of 15 to anywhere else, that when they're driving away from that party, they run into a telephone pole, or even worse, they run into another human being and kill them. I don't want to pay that price, 
And I don't have to because Jesus is Lord and he wants to be your Lord too. Now we're talking the gospel, okay? Now, that was last week. I felt glad to recap because as I asked some simple questions, all I got was... So I thought I would recap a little bit there. Now we're going to move into this week, okay? First we have the gospel. And the reason, the other reason I believe that there was talking and giggling and snickering while I was reading through the Romans room there is simplistically because it's a mundane conversation. It's kind of like if I talked to Aaron, if Aaron Rennie was here, and said, hey, tell me about giraffes. I'll tell you right now, for those that don't know this, there's a couple in the room that are going, no, don't do it. And the reason being is because they've actually heard Aaron talk about giraffes. It takes an hour. He says the same thing 300 different ways. And it's all about how there is a specific way that a giraffe's neck is created. That if it goes to drink, if their neck was not created this way, then their brain would explode. And the back of their head would blow out because it's like a sponge. That's literally the whole conversation of which we're all listening to. Like, we just don't care. Please don't talk about it. But, but he keeps going. However, here's the thing. This is I actually called Aaron and asked him permission to do this today because he said he was going to be here. I was going to have Aaron flip it to this conversation. Hey, those of you that were in Prime, do you guys remember when we were on our way to VBS and we were having that conversation right before we got into Paisley? Oh, my God. Oh. I See, here's the deal. Hold on, hold on. Here's the point, because it's not about the conversation. It's about the fact that Aaron would have flipped it from talking about giraffes, which nobody cares about. And unfortunately, when you're talking about the gospel, sometimes there's people that don't care. Because when you're just talking about Jesus Christ, for some reason, apparently Jesus is boring. And many times the reason Jesus is boring is because you make it boring. So don't let your Jesus be boring, first and foremost. But second off, the way that you flip it to where he's not boring is you do exactly what I just said. Hey, you guys remember when? Let me tell you about the time. There was this time in my life when my parents once told me every single one of those phrases and the lines that automatically grabs our attention. We can't help but to listen. And the reason we can't help but to listen is because we're about to go into a personal story, which means when we tell the story, people are going to be able to put a face to a story. Which leads us to tonight. Your testimony is the next important thing. And the way that you make Jesus interesting. The way that you make Jesus fun. The way that you make Jesus shine. And the way you make him known. Here's the deal, you guys. Tonight we want to talk about testimony. And just to lay this out real brief. The word testimony simplistically is another fancy word for your story. So we're going to interchange those words the word story, the word testimony, they mean the exact same thing. It doesn't matter what it is. I want you guys to take the tips that we have for you tonight about how to share and just do them. I'm going to have Eli go ahead and open us, open us up and continue to Yeah! So I hope you guys know that one of the most powerful tools you have to share God with is your personal story. It is an incredibly valuable asset that God will use to completely change someone. There is something about a powerful, is some, there's something powerful when someone starts opening up about their life. Because stories get a hold of us. Stories that are interesting, stories grab our attention, as Colton was just said. Our, and our stories is an amazing tool God uses to change people's lives. Be, Another great thing about story, sharing our testimonies about faith, is that it takes away some of the ability to argue. For example, if I tell you, God answered prayers, you can say, no, he doesn't. And then what if I tell you this instead? If I tell you that when I prayed for a wife and God gave me Marissa, it was answered. I got her. But God answers prayers in, this, in his own timing because he knows what we can and cannot handle. Like for me, it was three or four years when he answered mine. But for Marissa, it was almost 12 years. But he still answered prayers. Doesn't matter about the time. Or maybe, what if I ask, God wants to fill your lives, your everything in life. And you could say, no, he doesn't. So instead, I'll tell you, 
how about how I felt when I was a bad leader? I felt like I was a bad leader. I felt like I wasn't good enough. I was on the fence of leaving youth group. But then God gave me two boys who literally wouldn't leave me alone, no matter what they did or what I was doing. They knew I worked and they called me every day just to show me that I was good enough and God, how God loves me. And so within that, I know I'm a good leader. God filled that emptiness in my life. So you can't tell me that didn't happen. I was there. I felt it. It happened. Pass it off back to Colton. Check. Oh, this one works too. You don't have to fight for that. Um, you guys' stories are literally uh, kind of one of the most important tools and weapons, I could even say, in your uh, in your arsenal that you have, okay? I-, I need you guys to start looking at the world a little bit different, especially nowadays, okay? Because when you walk out of your doors, it's not like you're just walking out in to be an American in the outside world. It's not like you're just walking out to be another person. It's not like you're just walking out to be a girl or a guy. It's, it's, it's not like that. You are literally walking out into a war zone. And it's a spiritual war zone. Okay? It's where Satan's entire goal with us is to destroy us. Why would Satan want to destroy us so bad? Why does he hate us? Because we love God. Because we were made in this image. The reason Satan hates us is because we were made in God's image. Satan hates us because God created us to love him. God created us with one purpose in mind, and that purpose was to have relations with a being that would choose him. And so his entire goal is to devour us and destroy our hearts and destroy our emotions. But the word of our testimony is how we overcome. Understanding who we are in Christ. Understanding why we're saved. Understanding how to share those moments personally with people the way that Eli just did with you guys. If you guys were to try to say, hey, no, prayer's not real. To Eli, it's real. Because you can't take away the answered prayers that he has in his life. That's the goal with your testimonies, is to be able to come back with, oh, God's not real. He doesn't love anybody. Blessed me a lot in life, and I've still had to walk through hardship, and I've definitely walked through times where I've questioned the way that you're questioning God. Do you actually love me? Because I'm hurting right now, Lord. And every single time, God's proved it. Let me share a time. Your testimony means a lot when you share the gospel of Jesus Christ, you guys. Let me read this point here just to sum up. This is Revelations 12:11. They triumph over him by the blood of the Lamb. And by the word of their testimony, they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Here's the deal, you guys. To briefly sum up what that scripture is in that chapter, Revelations is the end of the book. Revelations is literally what we're living in right now. It prophesies about end times. It prophesies about the time frame that we as human beings would live in right before Jesus Christ was going to come back. And it's now. This is literally the coolest time of your life. It's scary. There's some different things about it that maybe you don't fully understand, but it's the reason why you should draw closer to Jesus Christ than ever, because God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but the power of love and a sound mind. In this simple scripture, in this simple chapter, what it's talking about is the dragon and how the, the, the dragon came to devour the woman because the woman was pregnant and going to give birth to a son. Now, I understand I'm talking right now, and you guys are like, where is he going with this? Oh, what is happening right now? In simplicity, what he's talking about is the woman, the son, us as people, were made in God's image. The dragons come to devour God's image and destroy it. And there was a war that took place in which the dragon and his angels, this is scriptural, it says it in Revelation 12, the dragon, which is Satan, and his angels, did their best to destroy human beings, did their best to destroy God's image. But the angels of God fought back. They beat Satan. They defeated him. And then God did what? Let's read that scripture again. You guys ready? Ready to get excited? They triumph over Satan. They triumph over him 
by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink away from death. Legitimately, you guys. If you guys will receive the blood of the Lamb, if you will receive Jesus Christ, the reason we talk about the blood of the Lamb isn't because, like, we're supposed to bathe in blood. That's weird. That's not Christian. But in our hearts, we are supposed to be purified by the pure blood of Jesus Christ. Our blood is wicked. Our blood is tainted. Our blood is fleshly. But Christ's blood is perfect because he lived a holy life here on earth. And if we are covered with his blood, we will be considered holy. So that's first and foremost. And the second way that you literally walk outside and kick Satan in the face, and you have the right to do it, is by the word of your testimony. The first tip on how to find out your testimony it is to look back, remember your life before you're a Christian. Or for those who are a Christian and born and raised in kind of a church, look back and look at the struggles you had, the doubts you had, the issues you had. Because when we're talking to people, we need to make sure they know we're not perfect. We all struggle and we all sin. Because too many Christians talk about the triumphs, the highs, the goods, everything happens because God's glory and stuff like that. And that's true. It really is. But they need to know that we sin. We're not perfect. We fall all the time. But we get back up because God is our Savior. So like last week we talked about the Roman road. About in Romans 3.23 it says, All have sinned and fall short of the glorious God, of God's glorious standard. Which means we all sin, right? All of us. Doesn't matter if we know Jesus or not, we've sinned. Whether it's in the past or present, we still sin. So we need to make sure the people we are trying to tell our testimony about, they know. They know we've sinned. Don't just tell people, hey, you're a sinner. Yeti Jesus. You need to admit to them, hey, I've sinned too. I need Jesus. That statement, y'all need Jesus, is so true. Y'all, all of us, need Jesus. And with that, you have less judgmental people and less people arguing with you because you've made it reality. You made it personal. You made it, hey, I messed up too. And that's the tip. first tip is back. <laughs> tip number two, remember. Remember the moment when you became a Christian. So you may not know that, or be able to pinpoint the exact date or time or even week that you knew Jesus, you accepted Jesus. But you can remember the month, the year sometimes, but you know the moment you got closer and closer to Jesus. And whether it's through a camp or a weekend retreat, when you really made your faith your own. Remember at these times helps recognize, reignite our passion and excitement for Jesus. Because Chances are you didn't get to know Jesus just because you were bored. You didn't turn to Jesus or rededicate your life because, man, I had nothing better to do. Something happened. Something happened that day, that week, that month, or that year. Jesus was calling to you and you knew it. You heard it. So remember that time. I'd be willing to bet that you can't share that experience without getting a little excited. And that's a good thing. Be excited about Jesus. So the first part about you guys' testimonies, we want to look at what God did. This part here, tip number three, is what is God doing right now? Okay? It's your now testimony. Okay? You guys can't forget. It's not just about what God has done in your life. For me, I have different moments. Simple moments like when I was six. I remember where I was at. Or specifically, if I walked you to the building in Lakeview, the church building in Lakeview, I could point out the spot in the ground I was on my knees and gave my life to God at six years old. When I was 11, I could take you to Boxar Ranch and put you in the spot up there at that campground where God called me to be a pastor and live my life in such a way as to represent Him. When I was 13 years old, I could take you up to Camp Davidson in Sisters, Oregon, and I could show you the spot where I was on my knees and I got filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking another language. You can't take those moments away from me. That is a part of my testimony. But there are things God's doing in my heart right now. And I spoke about them last week when I talked about the gospel of Jesus. And getting excited about the gospel of Jesus. Because the thing is, when we get excited about the gospel of Jesus and what he's doing right now, what it is is, is us being thankful for the fact that we get to be a part.
part of what he wants in life. We get to be a part of the end goal. We get to be a part of people getting saved. We get to be a part of marriages being healed. In your guys' case right now in schools, you get to be a part of depressed and broken and lost people that have no idea what to do and that don't feel accepted. Feeling accepted and feeling loved. No longer feeling broken. Why? Because you may not feel accepted, but you're not supposed to because you're already accepted by him. The fact is you're supposed to walk into school and you're supposed to look at people that are not accepted and go, hey, I accept you. I literally, I want to bring you in. I want to be your friend. Will you let me? Let me talk to you about Jesus Christ because that's the reason I feel accepted. That's the reason I don't feel alone. That's the reason I don't do drugs. That's the reason I'm not drinking. That's the reason I'm not sleeping around. It's because I'm whole. It's because I have an identity. It's because I'm living for the gospel. This is what God's doing in my life now. So third tip is don't forget your now testimony. Fourth tip, don't memorize a speech. You're not going to have a piece of paper pulled out. Like, hey, this is my testimony. I got saved at five. I got baptized at eight. Blah, blah, blah. Jesus rules. We don't do that. And it doesn't work. Conversations don't work that way. It may seem easy. It really does. It, it's the easiest thing. Oh, I can totally write it down. No, it's not how... You connect. And that's our goal is to connect and show them how we were loved so we can love them. So when, when you talk to somebody about your faith, you must actually have an engaging conversation with them. Don't just spout off a few quick lines like I just did. People can tell when someone's saying a rehearsed speech, and it will not have the power or meaning it could. Remember that we're talking about the difference that God has made in your lives. There is no better example than to follow Jesus himself. Jesus engaged people. Jesus talked to people. Jesus listened to people. And when he responded, he responded wisely. And there is no, no time where it is the same response. They're all different. So don't memorize a speech. And trust yourself and trust God has given you the story that he wants you to tell. Fifth and final tip. It comes straight out of the mouth of Jesus, and that is don't worry. Don't get too uptight, scared, nervous, or over, and don't overthink it. It's simple. Trust God. Because And just take a breath, breathe. Take a step back even if you need to. Take a breath in. Because the Bible says in Matthew 10, 19 through 20, God will give you the right words at the right time. For it is not you who will be speaking, it will be the Spirit of the Father speaking through you. So even though it's good to learn these tips and to have advice and for to how to share your faith and your testimony, your story, after it's all said and done, we just need to simply trust God. He will, he will speak through us. He will use us as long as we have open hearts. So we just need to remember that. God will give us the right words to say at the right time. So, um, can we go ahead and put those tips up? Look back. Remember your life. What's God doing in you now? Don't memorize his speech necessarily, but know those moments that happened. And then don't worry about it, you guys. Quite frankly, at the end of the day, it's not your job to get people saved. It's your job to share the gospel of Jesus and share your testimony by living your life for him. Okay, so we're gonna do we're gonna do something tonight, you guys, with the time that we have left. And um, I want you guys, you can just leave those tips up there for me. Um, I want you guys to go through and I want you guys to really understand your your testimony. I want you guys to actually look back. I want you to remember. I want you to focus on those things. I want you to think about what God's doing now in your life. And I don't necessarily want you to have it rehearsed. But I do want you to have an understanding of what it is that, um, I do want you to have an understanding of those places in life. I just spouted off a couple of them. Only three, you guys. I have so many more moments in my life that God has spoken to me. God has touched my heart. I have different camps, different conferences. I've had missions trips, different things that I've gone on throughout my life where God has wrecked my life. And it's because I have lived my life in a way to seek Him. If you're not living your life in a way to seek him and you don't feel like you have a testimony right now, here's what I want to say to you. And I, I 
I think that this is a thing that can happen, especially if you're a new Christian. You may not feel like you have a testimony, but you have the greatest testimony. You're at the beginning and you just received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Even if you're only a year or two saved, you're literally at that point, and that's the greatest point you could be at because it means you have life. It means Satan's going to come after you. It means he wants to devour you and he wants to kill you, but it means that with the word of your testimony, you get to defeat him every day of your life. And for those of you that grew up in the church and you feel like my testimony's not cool, I've heard people that get up and share, and they share about all the hell they walk through. They share about all the, the, the life choices they made that were terrible. They share about all these things. I don't have that. I haven't sinned enough to have a testimony. That is a lie from hell. If you feel that way. If you grew up in the church and you made very little mistakes, that's your testimony. And you've got to be excited about that because what it means is that you are literally living your life in a way to where you can receive the love of Jesus. Here's what scripture says. It says, he that suffered much loves much, but he that suffers little loves a little. If you're a church kid that's grown up in this place, in this building, and you've made little mistakes and you've suffered very little in your life, Chances are you're very harsh. Chances are you're not a very loving person. Unless you actually look at what you have as your testimony and refuse to be a hard person and an unloving person. Our testimony is one of the most important things we have. Do not believe that you don't have one because I promise you each and every person that here does if you've received Jesus Christ in your heart. And then from there, just go through the different moments. And if you don't have different moments right now, then pray and say, God, I want some moments. I want some moments. I want you to wreck my life. I want you to touch me in a way I've not been touched, Lord. I want to be able to trust you, but you prove to me that you're real. Prove it, God. My heart is open. I want to see your power. I want to know you're real. People say you're real. I've heard it in church, Lord God, but I don't know if I believe it. So what I want to do right now, I have some, some notebook paper that you guys can come and you can grab. Um, we've got some pens that are going to come forward right now. And if you guys would like to, just kind of spread out through this room and write down your testimony on a piece of paper. Try to go through and utilize these tips that are up here to remember those moments. Think about what God's doing and be prepared to spread the gospel through the Romans Road. We're going to be posting that a few times this year because I really believe that this is the year where you guys get to go in and take ownership of your school for God. But you have to be willing to do it. It's not going to be your pastor. There's very, I'm very limited in what I get to do, but quite frankly, the law still states that you guys get to represent Jesus Christ to the fullest on your campus as students. You're the missionaries, you're the pastors. You got this. So make it happen. Be bold, know your stuff. You don't have to know everything, but know the basic gospel and how to communicate it. Know your testimony and how to prove that Jesus Christ is real in your life anyways, and then represent him and from there, don't worry about it. Because the fact that you represent it means that that person does not get to say about you they didn't actually live like a Christian or a hypocrite. Does that make sense? Let's take a moment, you guys.